Hello and welcome to today's webinar, which is how to make an effective advertising claim. So just to let you guys know that this is going to be recorded um, and as usual, or if you haven't been here before, <laughs> um, I send a link to the recording straight after the event. Um, so you'll be able to view that online and you'll also be able to send that to colleagues and everything like that. There'll also be a Q&A towards the end, so feel free to make a note of any questions you might have as we go through, um, because there will be time at the end for me to answer those questions, or as usual, um, again, you can email me towards the end, or at the end of the webinar, if you've got any questions that you didn't think of during the webinar. Um, so thank you very much for joining today. Um, so this webinar is going to be, I'll go through to the agenda, um, this is very much um, kind of an overview of advertising claims. So I know with most of my webinars I'll tend to go territory specific or I'll look at different types of products, but this is very much just an overview um, to say how, you know, how, what's, what makes an um, advertising campaign successful, what makes it interesting, um, and what do you need to make sure that you can legally say those things about your products? What, how would you make an advertising claim compliant? So I'm gonna look a little bit at advertising standards globally and the organizations which regulate them. Um, so it won't be too specific today. Um, I'll just kind of give an overview of those organizations and also how you can find them. Um, so again, if we're not going too specific, at least it will give you a background on how you can have a look at those um, advertising organizations as well. Uh, we'll look at some of the legislation which surrounds advertising claims. I'm gonna look at some um, case studies of successful and also some unsuccessful advertising campaigns. Um, I'll talk a little bit how you recognize and how you develop those advertising claims, um, things like utilizing market research and looking at some recommendations for those case studies of what consumer research methodology you can use. Um, and also touching on questionnaire design and how that will support your advertising claims as well. So there's going to be quite a lot of information <laughs> kind of packed into this small webinar. So like I said, I won't be going too much into detail on all of these points. Um, so you might want to think about some questions that you might have specifically. Um, but yes, I will carry on. Um, so to give you an introduction to myself, my name's Karis, and I am the Consumer Studies um, Consultant and Regulatory Specialist for AIDS and Global Research. So what that means is I specialize in regulations which surround advertising and surround um, mainly cosmetics, but also other kinds of products because we're completely industry you know we, we can serve in any industry with consumer research um, but really what I look for is I, I really help people recognize what their advertising claims are and um, basically recommend the best um, methodologies that we can use and that everything that we can um, create for your studies to ensure that not only are you be able to say those claims about your products legally, um, but that you're really able to get the most out of your marketing. Um, I'll talk a little bit about consumer research, but the great thing about consumer research is that you can say some things about your products that because they need to be backed by science and they're backed by consumer opinion, you can get some really amazing marketing claims about your products. So my job is to look at basically provide a gap analysis for people and say, this is the evidence you currently have, or if you don't have any evidence, this is the evidence you need, and this is what we can do further to make sure you can say those claims. So I've worked alongside some a vary of clients. I've worked with some of the largest conglomerates in the world. <laughs> I've worked with some brand owners that are just starting out. We're very versatile with how we work and always ensuring that we can get the most out of that marketing. So I want to give an overview for advertising standards. Um, so basically, like I said, we'll talk about how you can find the right advertising standards that you need to be aware of. So the best place to start is looking at the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, because they've got a framework which countries have adopted, um, which is basically for them to have their own self-regulatory organizations, which regulate advertising standards in their own territories. So it's currently used in 42 countries worldwide, and there are 52 countries that have advertising self-regulations, um, regardless of whether that's following this framework. So I think it's a really good place to start if you're not sure about um, what countries you want to launch into, um, or if you um, have a kind of a, a kind of wide reach and you want to find out, you know, which countries have this regular um, this self-regulatory system. Um, then you can look at on the ICC and see which countries have adopted that framework and have a look at the framework itself and what is recommended to those countries. So basically, it's ensuring that they have legal honesty decent and truthful communications so we're, again we're going to touch on that a lot but these are the, really the keywords you need to think about when you're looking at advertising and making marketing claims about your product and it always needs to be backed up by evidence to be able to fit into these um, kind of keywords as well you need to make sure you have evidence to substantiate your claims so it's yeah it's a really good starting point if you're thinking about looking at advertising standards 
the next kind of step I'd go in, kind of the, lo the, la the layer underneath. So we've looked at what our framework is, um, and now I'm going to look at ICAST, which is the, um, can the International Council on Ad Self-Regulation. Now that was set up by the EASA, who are the European Advertising Standards Alliance. So in Europe in particular, um, we've got each sort of, um, quite a lot of countries have their own SROs. Then you've got the EASA, which are like an overarching um, SRO, which they all you know, adapt to the same kind of values, same code of conduct. And then you've got um, the ICAST, which was set up by the EASA. So it kind of brings together all those SROs under the EASA, but it also goes global. So you've got places like Australia, places in Asia, you've got places in America, South America, that are all part of ICAST. And again, they're all following this code of conduct. So again, Again, it's a great place to look if you're not sure um, about um, what the SRO is in the territory that you're looking to market, um, because they have a list there of all the people that are members of ICAST, and they also release news. So if there's any updates to their code of conduct and their shared values, um, they'll be displayed on the ICAST website. So again, it's kind of that next layer and a really good place to be looking if you're not sure about the advertising standards. Then we've got our country specific SROs. So these are really the people, um, again, once you've identified your markets and you've identified which countries you're looking to launch in, you really wanna look specifically at the code of conduct of the advertising SROs that are in that territory. So I've pulled up a couple that are all um, sort of part of ICAS, um, apart from the FTC, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well. But you've got sort of the UK, South Africa, Philippines and Brazil. These are my examples of sort of saying these are all from different continents and yet they are still sharing the same values and they're all still sharing the same code of conduct. What their job is to do is to adopt their code of conduct from things like the ICC and ICAS and then they're enforcing it. So they become a platform where people can complain about your product or your advertising claims. They then investigate them, see if you've got the evidence to substantiate them and if not there are different penalties they can enforce um, if your advertising to advert does not meet their code of conduct. So your complaint could come from a consumer. If a consumer purchases your product and it says, um, you know, younger looking skin in 10 days and they don't feel like they've got that, they can obviously complain about your product to their SRO um, and then the SRO can investigate it and make sure you've got some evidence to substantiate it. If you've got evidence in place, um, then you're absolutely fine because they'll say, well, you know, it might be this one person didn't notice that effect, but we can see in a study of over 200 people, they all did notice an effect or the majority of them did so they don't have to withdraw your advert if you didn't have any evidence they could the other people that might complain about your product could be your competitors um, so if you were to be quite brazen with your advertising which is fine you know you can do it and say you know this product is as good as our competitor and mention the product in your advertising um, that competitor might very much want to draw upon your advert and say you know, I don't think this is right. And then you have to have some kind of evidence which says that in a comparison study um, that was completely blind into the consumers, they didn't know what the brands were, our product performed better. Your competitors could still complain, um, even if you didn't go directly sort of against them, um, because obviously they might, if they find that you've got a claim about your product and they've got a similar product on the market and they don't understand, you know, how are they able to say that about the product because we can say that about ours, maybe they didn't think about the right kind of testing, um, they might still complain about it. So it's really important to note that these are the kind of um, these are the companies that could be approaching you if your um, products come under any scrutiny and asking you for your evidence. So again, it's really important to be aware of. There are different rules in each territory as well um, about the amount of time you might have to produce your evidence. For example, in the UAE, it's really, really strict. And I think it's something about two weeks that you have to produce your evidence. So if you've got a claim that says something along the lines of younger looking skin in four weeks and you don't have evidence to support it, there is no way that you could quickly run a study and get that four week evidence because you've only got two weeks to produce it. So it's really important to have that evidence in place before you launch your product as well. I was going to talk about the FTC because they work slightly differently. Now, the, all the other um, advertising regulation um, SROs I've got on this um, page, they're all um, self-regulatory. So they basically, that they work with the government, but they're not a government body. Whereas the FTC are, they're a federal agency, which means they have a lot more power um, in investigating your product than other um, countries might have. They can also, um, whereas SROs kind of deal on a complaint basis, the FTC can investigate your product from the get-go and they basically act as the police. They can be a point where, you know, you see a lot of lawsuits in America. They're able to produce lots of lawsuits and um, 
huge kind of stud, um, case studies against um, people. So uh, again, be extra careful if you are looking um, at, uh, at um, selling your product in the USA, and it's also the same in the UAE as well. Um, again, there's there's bigger in, sort of um, enforcements that are in place. So you need to be super aware of what um, the regulations are in that territory. Examples of advertising laws. Um, so. Again, we've got our SROs, we've got the people that are regulating your adverts, but then there are certain laws that are in place in every territory as well. So, for example, again, I'm, I'm kind of bringing up the UAE a lot, but I know that they've got um, a lot of federal sort of things in place there. Um, if you have looked at the SRO there and you know who they are, uh, which is actually the um, advertising business group in the UAE. Um, so they're the, the SRO, but then they've also got the National Media Com Council who have the right to enforce the penalties because they're actually part of the, they're acting on, um, on behalf of the law. Um, so really important to know, okay, the advertising business group, the ABG, are going to regulate the adverts and deal with complaints, but there's also the National Media Council. So I need to be really aware of the laws that they're enforcing before I put my, ad my, before I put my adverts there. It's the same with the FDA um, in, in the USA, so you've got the FTC who are regulating the ads, and the FDA who have got the laws in place, um, so that before you even think about what your advert are, you need to make sure that you're complying with those laws. And again, in China, you've got um, the advertising law uh, of the People's Republic of China, which was revised um, a few years ago to have stricter um, regulations and to strengthen their consumer protection as well. So really important to have a look at those kinds of laws. And again, that's the same in any country you're looking at, there will be laws in place. Um, I want to talk about um, COVID-19 a little bit. I feel like we have to. <laughs> it's not going away anytime soon. And it's something that we've seen a lot of products be launched um, coming out of the COVID-19 situation. Now that's not necessarily a negative thing. A lot of companies are making things like hand sanitizer, which is very, very needed. Um, things like face masks, where people are being recommended, recommended to wear face masks now. But it's really important to know that even if you're launching a product um, to deal with the COVID-19 situation or to help with it, you still, um, the, the laws still apply to you and the regulations still apply to you. So all of the advertising regulations that are in place and all of those advertising standards, they still very much apply um, in this kind of pandemic crisis right now. And it's really important to make sure that you're not putting anything misleading out into the public making sure that all of your claims are substantiated um, and that you know you're still abiding by all of that code of conduct the main thing is is you don't want to exploit people's fear um, so we've seen some of that and unfortunately not no no it's, it's not a, a, it's a very small percentage of the products that are being launched out of the pandemic um, but i've seen some adverts you know that are very much like this is the cure for for COVID-19 or this is the only thing that can protect you against COVID-19 and, and it's completely um, exploiting people's fear to make sure they can sell more products. Um, so the I, um, you know, ICAS, the EASA, Connor Red, who do with South um, America, these are all, they're all very looking very closely at the adverts that are coming out um, during this pandemic. So be very careful. And um, like I said, it's, it's a great time to be launching new products, especially if you can do anything that helps, but be very cautious of the claims that you're making about your products. Um, so there's some more information on the, the um, website about that. And also you can always ask for advice um, either directly with ICAST or you can ask myself um, if you're not sure about your claims and what you're saying and what evidence you need to substantiate them, um, especially to do with the COVID-19 situation. It's very much the same in the USA as well. Um, so the FDA and the FTC have also been um, very carefully looking at the market and policing people that have been, um, you know, releasing kind of uh, false claims claims about their product. I've brought out some examples here. Um, so they're all to do with people saying that, you know, it can, it can um, prevent COVID-19 or treat it, uh, making sure that it's safe to, uh, you know, making sure that saying that their product is safe to use against COVID-19. And again, these aren't fair. Um, this was actually back in April that I got brought these ones up, but they released, they're releasing weekly um, statements about the companies that they have wrote letters to. So it's really interesting. And again, it's a great place to look. If you're thinking about making any products out of COVID-19, I'd recommend having a look at what's being released because you can see what people are getting um, warned about saying. Um, so it gives you, again, an idea of basically what not to do um, rather than what to do. So I'm going to talk more. So we've done, talked about all of our advertising standards and all of those organisations. So now we're going to look at claims uh, and advertising claims. And what are they and what do they mean and everything like that? 
So I'm going to be talking mainly about cosmetics. Um, so even if you're not part of a cosmetic company, um, I recommend carrying on watching anyway, because it will also be applicable to a lot of industries. Um, and I'm also, like I said, we're completely, um, we're versatile of any industry. Um, so a lot of this will apply to yeah, any industry at all. Um, but cosmetics are a great place um, to start when talking about marketing claims, because it's where we see the most marketing claims. And it's why I always talk about cosmetics, because it's where we do the majority of our work. Um, you know, every product that you see in the market that's a cosmetic has, you know, 10 claims on it that all need to be substantiated. Um, whereas, you know, something like a household product, you're really just looking at the efficacy um, and maybe the fragrance and things like that. So it's not quite as um, a sort of uh, ex explanatory in the way that they talk about their different claims and, and everything like that. So the definition of a cosmetic claim is anything that is put into the public. So this is going to include anything that's on TV, radio, magazines, websites, um, pack copy. These are all, um, it's all stuff that's put into the public domain and you're saying claims about your product. So um, the cosmetics directive, um, say that to make sure um, you're not being misleading to meet the requirements and the benefits delivered should be consistent with the reasonable consumer expectations created by the claims. Um, so obviously, you know, you can't sort of make really crazy claims about your product. They have to be, um, again, they have to be substantiated by evidence, which helps with that, but also, um, you know, they, they have to be really reasonable with the expectations. Um, uh, things like miracle cream, um, that was always a bit of a, an interesting one with the ASA because you can't, you know can't perform a miracle um <laughs> so you really need to think about you know being realistic with the claims and making sure you get evidence to substantiate them um so you need to um it is essential to consider the overall impression that the average consumer would have in the context context of the product presentation or advertising uh, and again this is going to relate to things like you know mascara ads have been in trouble for having false eyelashes on there um foundation ads for having airbrush models um it, you need to consider you know the context of it um, because the presentation could be exaggerated um, and it's not really fair on your consumer you're misleading them um, I, I want to bring up from ICAS because they say about claims on labels and packaging. So generally people always think about claims as the things that are put on your website, the things that are put on TV, the things that are put into print advertising, but it very much relates to what's on your pack copy as well. So SROs generally historically didn't look as much on the pack copy um, and didn't look as well, unless obviously they're complained about. Um, but now they're really considering looking at everything that's on that pack copy because at this point, you know, in time, it's become really essential for you when you've got your products on a shelf in the market, um, in the stores, you need to make sure that everything that your product can do is written on that pack copy because you want it to, you know, if consumer picks up one bottle against another and is comparing them, they're going to be looking at those claims and the claims that stand out, that's going to be the product they purchase, sometimes regardless of price. So it's really important to make sure you're still following the same regulations for pack copy claims as you are for any other kind of advertising. So common criteria for cosmetic claims. And again, I've brought up the EU regulation, um, but this does apply very globally. Um, it's just that it breaks it down really, really nicely here um, in terms of kind of really considering all the different common criteria. So, that, so they've got six common criteria for cosmetic claims. Again, this applies to any industry and again, it can apply to any country. Um, so I'll break them down. So legal compliance is all to do um, with, you can't say um, on your product or in your marketing that the product complies with EU regulation, blah, 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 um, because it has to. So that is not a claim about your product. That is a legal requirement and you cannot use that as a kind of marketing benefit um, because every single product in the market has to comply with those regulations anyway. It has to be truthful. Um, you can't say, you know, um, that the product is cruelty free if it has, if it isn't, if it hasn't got that loop, leaping bunny certification. So you have to be very truthful. Um, this has come under um, scrutiny quite a lot recently for things like vegan products, organic products. Um, there's been a bit of an uproar in the industry for people that have got the um, certifications and for people that don't, but they, you know, they're naming their company something like organic blah, 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 um, because it's kind of leading the consumer to think that it's something that it's not necessarily. Um, so I think that there's going to be, I mean, at the moment, there, there's not a lot about it, um, because obviously if it's not got the certification on there, um, it, you know, you still got things in there that say it's organic, um, 
but it's kind of making the industry really fair here and making sure it's really truthful. So I think there's going to be a little bit of a difference, a bit, bit of a change soon about what um, is going to allow a company to say things like organic and natural. So I'd very much watch this space. Evidential support. So again, this is what a lot of this presentation is going to be about. Um, and this is making sure that you have evidence to substantiate all of the claims you're making about your product, whether that's scientific or consumer perception based. It needs to be honest. Um, so you can't say um, that um, you, if you were looking, you know, you can't manipulate your data, basically. So if you had a study with 200 people on it, um, 100 people of them said positive things, 100 people of them said negative things. You couldn't just take away the 100 people that said negative and say 100% of 100 people said that this product was the best product they ever used because you're completely manipulating that data and getting rid of the people that had a negative effect. Um, you have to say that 50% of the overall 200 panel said that they liked the product. Um, so that's about all being honest in your marketing. Fairness, um, you can't do a comparison about products. So for example, you can look at comparing an anti-dandruff shampoo against a product which has no anti-dandruff properties and saying that it's better for removing dandruff. That's not fair. And it needs to, you need to allow your consumer to make informed decision making. So basically this means making your, your claims really, really clear, really, really understandable. Um, so, you know, like I said, it's not up to kind of um, interpretation. It's, they can be really informed about their decisions when they're purchasing your product. And what types of claims are there? So um, I've taken this from the Cosmetics, Toiletries and Perfumery Association because they have a really great way of breaking down the different types of claims and talking generally about the kind of evidence that is required. Again, every claim is very different. And you'll know this if you've kind of been to any kind of uh, webinars talking about claims before. There's no way to really generalize them because every product is different, every claim is different, all the ingredients are different. Um, so you can't kind of say, you know, you know, for for a moisturizer, you always need 120 people to do a consumer perception test. That's not always going to be the case. But this is a great way of sort of saying, okay, these are the general kind of claims that you can make, and these are the kinds of evidence that you're going to be able to support them with. So sensory and product aesthetic claims kind of fall under the same category, where it's everything to do with the feel of the product, the look of the product, it could be doing with the packaging, all of that kind of thing. So that can obviously be substantiated for your consumer perception data. Performance claims is all about the efficacy of the product. So you may have instrumental and you may have consumer data which is all to do with the, yeah, exactly. Um, how does the product actually work? If it's supposed to diminish wrinkles, does it diminish wrinkles? And that's what we're looking at there. Ingredients claims is to do with obviously the ingredients that are in the product. Um, so for example, it could be something like contains vitamin C, which does this to the skin. Um, um, but you need to make sure obviously you're following the regulations in the territory that you're selling it in and you have the right level of that ingredient to be able to say that claim. Combination claims is all to do about um, maybe a regime working together. So we often see products, um, for example, a shampoo, a conditioner and a hair serum. And they'll say things like this works best when used with this other product of the same brand. So you need to test all those products together to ensure that the consumers can perceive um, a, a great effect when using it all together rather than kind of singularly, because you obviously can't say it works better with it if you've got no evidence to say that. Comparison claims. So again, this is, I mentioned this earlier a little bit, it could be against a competitor to say, you know, this foundation is better than the leading foundation and that kind of thing. Um, but it could also be to do with a formula. So if you reformulated um, your product and you wanted to say a new and improved formula, you could do a comparison study against those formulas to prove that. Subjective claims are all about consumer research and consumer perception studies, which is what I'll be talking about a lot. Um, and that, again, is to do with, you know, for that subject, what is personal to them? What can they perceive personally? Whereas objective claims are about the science behind the product. So it's going to be your instrumental studies and things like that. There's no opinion based on it. It's all science. I just want to touch on questionnaire design because we're talking about you know how we're making an effective advertising claim the questionnaire is going to be the most important thing um, other than the study design when you are looking at making an effective advertising claim um, so obviously we're all trained at Global research for questionnaire design so we can always help with this we've been trained by the mrs which is the market research society so we can make sure that not only are our um questionnaires the most effective um but also they're going to be really ethical and so if you ever came under scrutiny we well, you know it's been done with the best practice possible 
So this is the kind of um, general sort of rules of thumb when you're looking at questionnaire design. So make your answer groups consistent. So if you're looking at maybe a one to nine scale uh, with one being strongly disagree and nine being strongly agree um, and a neutral answer in the middle, keep that consistent throughout your questionnaire. Don't start changing it up to then a three scale, five scale, um, because it's going, it's going to be difficult for the consumer to answer. And it can also be, be misleading because obviously the less um, answer groups they have, the less options they have, can drive them more towards a specific answer. So always make sure you're consistent and always make sure those answer groups are appropriate. Um, so obviously you don't want to sort of um, say something like, how did you feel about the, uh, how, how did you feel about your um, skin when you applied this product? And then the answer group to yes, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> um, the questions must be appropriate. So obviously the only thing about your claims and think about the product you're making, don't start gathering data about other things that are completely inappropriate to the study. Make your question very clear. Um, this can be something, um, you, it sounds really obvious, but I have worked with clients before when they kind of gone a bit of a tangent with a question. It's like, but what are you actually asking the participant? Um, it can be the same way with word claiming. There's a lot of things like, um, I know, for example, things like anti-pollution. What does that mean? We can get an anti-pollution claim, but we need to break down to the consumer. What does anti-pollution actually mean? Because they need to be able to answer that. And I generally is, you know, as a kind of word, this product has anti-pollution properties. There's no consumer that's going to be able to say, oh yeah, it does without knowing what that is broken down. I always put my questions in present tense, and this is just because it makes it really clear um, that it, the consumer is talking about the product they're using currently. Um, so, for example, it could be, you know, we, we had one the other day we had to correct from a client um, because it said my skin was um, was clearer. And we said, well, you know, it could sound like it was clearer before they started using the product. Um, so we need to make sure that it says, you know, my, product, my skin is clearer after using the product, essentially. Um, always consider free text answers. Um, not only does this give you a really good feedback that's outside of what you've asked your um, what, what's outside of what you've asked your participants, but it also allows you to get te volunteer testimonials, which you can use in your marketing. So, for example, you know you might have the really good efficacy of the product, but then when you go in your free text answer, says anything you disliked about the product, they could all maybe say the fragrance. And actually, you could find that if you hadn't asked that, you hadn't given them an opportunity to talk about the fragrance at any other point in the study. And when you sell your product, they could all hate the fragrance and it won't sell very well. So that's really important. And then for testimonials, as long as the um, comment reflects the nature of the data. So, for example, if someone said, my skin has never looked younger and everyone else also agreed with that question about the product, say it gave them younger looking skin. You can then use that as a testimonial when you're advertising, which is a really effective advertising um, sort of method. Um, of course, the wording should always match the claim. So, again, don't sort of say, um, my skin looked more youthful and then the actual claim was going to be look younger looking skin. It's slightly, it sounds like the same thing, but it's slightly different wording. Um, so always make sure the wording is, is matching the claim exactly. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about poor questionnaire design as well. So there's lots of things that can make poor questionnaire design. So I've taken this from the MRS guidelines for questionnaire design because I thought this would be the kind of um, the best example of what the really common criteria are for um, for basically uh, bad questionnaires for poor questionnaire design. Um, so things like excessively lengthy questionnaires. Um, so obviously, if you're kind of asking the same kind of questions over and over, your participants going to get bored. They're going to be like, well, I've kind of already answered that before. Um, and maybe if, if it's a four week study for a day cream and you're asking them every single day, does your skin look younger? Does your skin look younger? Um, by the time they're asked the 28th time, they might just not really want to answer the question. So consider things like maybe asking after a week, after two weeks, and after four weeks, because they're realistic time points that you're going to start noticing a difference. Um, things like re repetitive questioning. So again, like I said, you know, you, it's, it's the kind of the same thing with lengthy, but you don't want to kind of ask the same thing again and again and again. Um, insufficient opportunity for respondents to have their say. Again, that's all to do with answer groups. Make sure the answer groups are appropriate, but also make sure that they, they're able to um, say their honest opinion about it. So we, we often have um, sort of a different, different approach to questionnaires depending on the claims and the products, but neutral answers always comes up where you've got your neither agree or disagree answer in the middle. Sometimes we don't need to have that, but sometimes we do. 
because we need to make sure that the response can have a neutral response. So if you ever come to me and ask about question letter design and I'm saying that you need a neutral response in that, there is a reason for it. It's because we've reviewed the claim and we've reviewed what the consumers, um, you know, what the consumers are opportunities for them to have their say. Um, but otherwise, you know, it, as long as if it's very, very clear that they can either disagree with it or not agree with it, you can have it otherwise. Um, and that applies to some other kinds of questionnaire answer groups as well. Um, you also don't want to have an excessive classification section, so don't sort of go off on a tangent about their demographic um, if you just want to know if they like the colour of a lipstick. Um, it's not necessarily going to be fair on the consumer to gather that kind of um, data from them. And again, we can always advise on that as well. I just want to point your direction as well into uh, to the CTPA. I know I'm touching them earlier, um, but they have some really fantastic resources um, for advertising claims. Again, it's going to be very cosmetics based, but actually if I was part of any industry, I would really take a look at it because like I said, it breaks down all your different kinds of claims. It breaks down um, the kind of different evidence you need. Um, so they've got their guide to advertising claims and their confidence in cosmetic claims booklets. Um, so yeah, I'll go on their website and have a look at those um, to get a bit more further detail on what I've talked about today. And again, we, I'm always really up to date with the kind of information they're providing. So if you're not sure and it, it's all kind of um, too much to take in, too much information, feel free to reach out with your products and your claims and I can give you some great advice on that. Um, so now I want to talk about consumer research. So we've talked about advertising standards um, and who regulates them. We've talked about um, what claims are and what kind of claims you've got. Now we want to talk about how do you substantiate those claims. So I've talked about, about claims substantiation. There are different methods that you can use to substantiate claims, but generally they're going to fall into one or two brackets. One is going to be instrumental and scientific research, and one is going to be about consumer research. Obviously, I'm going to talk about consumer research because that is what we provide. <clears throat> but um, obviously, you know, I will always be very honest if you think that you need any other kind of research to substantiate your claims. We do have partners um, that are specialists in clinical and scientific studies, so we can combine those as well. But generally, consumer research is what you're going to use to get your marketing claims. And like I said, it's about making effective advertising claims and making successful advertising campaigns. So you're going to want some kind of consumer research to be able to do that. So consumer studies are also known as things like in-use tests. Um, so generally, we're looking at doing in-home studies. So we send the products for um, people to test at home and they answer questionnaires online. This reflects the actual condition part of the product in use. Um, so obviously, when someone purchases your, purchases your product um, in the kind of real world, um, they're not, they, they, you know, they'll follow the usage instructions that you put in your pack copy, but it's not going to be like some dermatologist putting it on their skin. So it's going to be exactly, it's going to exactly reflect the real world data that you'll get when you sell your product. It's really important to gather that. Also gives you a chance to kind of look at your usage directions as well. We've had a lot of where we've tested products and the usage directions haven't been clear. So before, again, they're putting that on the market, um, we're able to look at that. And um, they are, when they put that on their pack copy in the market, those issues directions have been reviewed essentially. Um, but what it means is we're looking at the perception of the study. So as well as saying about subjective claims. Um, so it's, you know, you can have a scientific study which might say something um, along the lines of wrinkles are reduced by such and such a percentage, but actually the consumer might not be able to perceive that with their naked eye when they purchase the product. Um, so what we're looking for consumer studies is, you know, something along the signs of um, I had a noticeable reduction in the appearance of my wrinkles um, and that is going to be substantial enough to be able to say that claim on your pack copy. There are times when you may need additional evidence. Generally, you're looking at a body of evidence for any kind of claim anyway. And again, I'm always able to advise if you're not sure what kind of evidence you need to have in place. Generally, I would always recommend having consumer research data, regardless of whether you have scientific, because like I said, sometimes scientific evidence isn't enough, but often there are things that you can say just with consumer research data, which is a lot more cost and time effective than doing clinical research. There are also claims, like I said, about marketing, things like I would buy this product, I would recommend this product, um, this is the best product I've ever used, this is better than my usual brand. These are all consumer perception claims, and these are the claims that make your products sell. 
Um, so why conduct consumer studies? Um, we talked about substantiating advertising claims and testing your product's efficacy. It also makes sure that your product is regula regulatory and re legally compliant in your chosen markets. So again, you may have clinical data um, or even consumer research data in one market, in one territory, for example, the USA. Um, but then you start selling your product in the EU, in Asia, in Australia, and you're finding there's a very different, um, there's some different product regulations in those territories, but also there's different ambient temperatures, there are different skin types, hair types. So actually your claims are not substantiated in that territory on that type of hair or type of skin. Um, so you need to make sure you're really considering um, having, you know, if you're looking at a global market, you've got some consumer research data from each territory um, because you're really looking at the product's performance in that territory as well, as well as satisfying their regulatory um, needs in those territories for advertising. It means that you can take a look at um, the product acceptability in those territories as well. So again, you know, it's not just about, you know, how does the product perform, but do people like the product? Is it going to sell there? Um, what's their propensity to buy in those countries? So if you haven't already launched your product globally and you're thinking about it, you can actually look at targeting key territories where you know it's going to do well because it's performed well in your consumer research. You can also target your demographic generally. So if you're not sure about what products you're, um, you want to target your market to, you can look at maybe looking at some different markets in consumer research, or if you know exactly what demographic um, you want to, want to target for your product, you're, you can you know, test the product on that demographic and ensure that it is suitable for that as well. So there's some excellent research you can put into place to make sure that your product is going to be really successful and your claims are going to be really successful on your product. And there's some examples of the kind of claims you can make um, from consumer research data. So things like 88% of people agree that it moisturizes the skin. Nine out of 10 women recommend this product to a friend. 96% of people agree this is the best their skin has ever looked. Again, really powerful advertising claims that should make a real success of your advertising. So where can you see these claims? Um, so once you've got your consumer research data, um, let's have a little look at some really successful places people have put their advertising. Sorry, it's got really dry throat today. <laughs> um, so we've got claims online. So I've just taken a few examples um, of people that have got their results posted on their websites. Um, so we've got Drunk Elephant, Philip Kingsley, Charlotte Tilbury, and these are all of the claims that they've got from their independent consumer uh, consumer research studies um, and as you can see you've got some really really strong claims there um, which are going to really really help them sell their product and I'm sure you find that people that have put this on their advertising in their online um, advertising are probably going to sell much more products because they're really stating to people you know if people say 100% or even 90 something percent of people agree with these claims you're going to feel very very confident purchasing the product um, whereas if you haven't got any data on that at all um, you're not going to really know, you know, do they have any data to substantiate that? Um, and if they do, is it really poor? Is that why they haven't got it displayed? So these are the ones that are really going to sell your products. Uh, you also need to have advertising claims on TV. So uh, particularly in the UK, you absolutely must have your advertising claims on your television adverts. Um, so I've taken some adverts from, uh, I think it's Rimmel, um, uh, L'Oreal and John Frieda. So they've all put the percentage of how many women agreed with um, the claim, and that's the claim they'll be discussing in the advert. Um, so again, it's really important to have that data in place so you can advertise on TV, but again, it also it really helps with your advertising as well. I'm very aware that you need at least 70% of a pass mark to be able to even allow to to even be able to allowed to put your claims on TV. Um, so really important if you wanna go into TV advertising to make sure you've reached at least 70% agreement on any of the claims that you would like to make. Um, the other place is on shopping channels. Um, so I've put up key QVC um, because obviously they are a really popular advertising channel. Um, I'm going to share a little clip um, from QVC. Uh, so sorry, bear with me a minute while I do. I hate doing the uh, technology side. Um, so that is should be sharing there. Great. So this is going to be a clip from Elemis, who um, often put all their consumer research data onto their QVC. Obviously, they have to have some kind of evidence anyway, um, but you really clearly see it on there um, and they're really popular on QVC as well. 
By the way, let's just have a look at the uh, Pro Collagen Eye Revive Mask, of course, which is, which is the, the new. This is amazing. Now, 100% um, of uh, those uh, that uh, did speak, of course, uh, agreed that the product helped reduce the visible signs of aging overnight. 100% agreed uh, this product helped improve the look of skin firmness and elasticity around the uh, delicate eye area. And 100% agreed the product made the skin around the eyes significantly younger or to appear significantly younger which is really impressive because this is some great um, so I'll just go back to the presentation so yes as mentioned um, it's really important you need to have some kind of evidence when you're putting your products onto shopping channels and this is because every bit of script they talk about has to be substantiated obviously they are talking for a long time on there they use like half hour intervals of talking about the product so they need to have that data to make sure they can talk about the product and talk about what it does um, it's really important to note as well that all um, all, all evidence that's used on these shopping channels uh, particularly key VC has to be dated within one year of submission of the sample. So you might have a product that you've had on the market for 10 years and you've been using that data to substantiate your claims, but if you want to get it onto QVC, it has to be within a year, it has to be recent. So if you're thinking about going onto QVC and you haven't got up-to-date information and, and, and um, data about your product, uh, make sure that you've got that up to date. Some other recommendations there and requirements, it's all on the QVC website. Again, other shopping channels have different um, kind of requirements, but generally QVC are a bit of a trendsetter for this kind of thing. So you know, if you're compliant with QVC, you'll be compliant with the shopping channels as well. So now I really want to talk about a case study specifically. So we've talked about everything. We talked about our advertising. We've talked about the different organizations. We've looked at claims and what they are, what is consumer research. Now, what happens when we put this into practice? When we're looking at consumer research, how do we design the study to make sure we can substantiate the claims that are needed? Now, there are about a, a, so many different, well, we've got over 10,000 studies on record. So choosing a really good case study is not easy for me. I've got so many good case studies that we've worked on. Um, but I chose to do this one because we're looking at curl types, um, which I think is a really interesting uh, breakdown of data and an interesting claim to make. Um, so again, there's going to be a lot to talk about here. <laughs> so we'll just look at this one today. Um, so this is for a curl shine oil, which is uh, manufactured by um, one of the largest contract manufacturers of personal care and beauty. Um, so this was put in beh on behalf of their client who needed to substantiate the claims. So the main claim we're looking for here is to substantiate that it's suitable for all curl types from 2A to 4C. So as people, uh, if you work in hair care, you might know, um, there's like nine different curl types um, that you can, um, maybe possibly more than that. Yes, <laughs> there's a lot of different curl types that are um, in place. Um, so if you want to make the kind of claim or suitable for all the curl types, you're going to need a significant amount of data from each one to be able to substantiate your claim. Um, so, because this is um, being sold in Europe, um, I've taken out some legislation from the EASA. Um, basically, they're saying that they need to, before you've got any, um, before you put anything effort out there, before you put anything into the um, public domain, you need to make sure that you've got some kind of evidence to substantiate direct or implied claims. So that's a really important thing to notice about well, as well, is that there's, if there's anything, any implication you're making about your product. And this is what we often get asked about when we say, well, you know, I've, I've got this kind of ingredient in my product, um, which, you know, so they, they, which can do this, it can nourish the skin or something like that. Um, can I say that about my product? Well, no, it's an implied claim. If you're saying it contains this ingredient, which has this effect, you also need to test the final product because otherwise you're implying that the final product will have that effect when it actually might not because you haven't tested it. So you need to make sure you have that evidence in place. And again, you have to provide it without delay to the SRO, the, the self-regulatory organization, which is applicable in the country where the complaint has been received. So again, you need to make sure you have that all in place before you put your adverts out in the public domain. Otherwise, you could find yourself in a bit of trouble. 
Um, it's important to note that if you don't have any kind of current claims substantiation on your products um, and you're aware they're in the market and you're concerned, um, this is something that you can retrospectively look at. It's not advised and it's not really compliant, um, but it's better late than never is what I would say. Before you get a complaint about your product, make sure you get some kind of evidence in place um, before you can come under scrutiny. And if you don't pass the, the test, if you find that actually your claims aren't compliant in the market, withdraw your advert immediately and look at revising those, those claims. Um, so for this particular study, what was the study designed? So it's reasonably simple because the real claim that we're looking at is just about um, what, making sure that we have those curl types on the study. So it was only one product, so single placement, we're only investigating the curl oil. It's only 14 days long because we're just looking at the kind of um, sensory effects that the product has, um, the aesthetic effects, obviously the efficacy effects, um, but the, you know, for a curl oil, they're quite immediate results. We got some females and some males in the study because we want this to be open to, or to both genders. But the main point is, is we've got 12% of each curl type. So 12% of 2A, 2B, 2C, then 3A, 3B, 3C, and 4A, 4B, 4C. Because we're looking at making sure we've got a, a, you know, a, a significant amount of each um, of people with each hair curl type on the study. 12% sounds low, but we recruited over 300 people for this study to make sure that we could cover a significant amount on each curl type there. Um, so this was the results. I've, I've drawn a few kind of claims out of what was taken from our results. Um, so to let you know, um, our async label research reports are all in real time. So what that means is you can access your reports online um, through our client portal at any time. You have not got to wait for a final report because the statist statistical analysis is built in. So what it means is if, if you know, as soon as you've got the 200, you know, 300 people that you need to answer your questionnaire. As soon as they've answered it, you can download that report straight away and start analyzing your results. Um, you haven't got to wait any longer than that. Um, and you can even start looking after the first week, after the second week. Um, so you can start to look at the initial results before you even got your final report, uh, before you got the final report through either. And you always got access to that at any point. Um, the report breaks down every single question and gives you some statistical analysis, um, some different types of analysis for each question. But what I want to look at today, um, just to give you an overall idea of how the claims are um, recorded, is the summary report. So this is the summary table which is generated, which has a breakdown of every question on the left. Um, it says how many people, the number of people that were satisfied, neutral, and not satisfied, and then the percentage of people that were satisfied, neutral, and not satisfied. So what you're looking for with your claims is the percentage of people that were satisfied. The first thing you're looking for is that it's achieved the pass mark, so you can use that claim on any kind of advertising, pack copy. Um, for example, as I was saying earlier, for TV, you need to have 70%, so that would probably be your pass mark, is to say we want 70% of people that agree with the product. And they'll be asterisked, as you can see from here, um, if they've reached that pass mark. So anyone that's got an asterisk, you know, you can put straight into your advertising. The other thing that you can do is then use it in your advertising directly. So for example, the first claim would be 70% of people agree that they love this hair oil. So that would go straight into your, um, into your website, go straight into all of that kind of marketing. Really, really easy to read and really, really easy to access. So the claims that we've kind of looked at here as they love the hair oil, um, it helps control frizz, um, it's, it's how smooth does your hair after using this hair oil and um, so that people were saying it was very smooth. Um, and does this hair oil give your hair, shine, hair an amazing shine and gloss? Again, great percentages there. And then what we will be looking for for the all hair type claim is reviewing the data for every single curl type and ensuring that we've had a pass mark for every single statement, every single question on that report. And if so, we can say it's suitable for each curl type. And I'm really pleased to say that on this study, we did manage to get the, that claim as well. So I don't want to talk too much about case studies today. Um, so that's kind of just an overall look at how that was used to be able to make um, substantiate those claims. Um, if you want to talk about any other kind of product or any kind of claims, feel free to reach out to me at any point. But once you've got your consumer research data, once you've got that evidence, you need to make sure that you have submitted into your product information file. So if you know if you work in the cosmetics industry, if you work in yeah, any kind of industry, you'll have a product information file about your product. Um, it'll include everything about the safety data, the cost listings, um, all of your undesirable effects that have been reported. Um, but it also needs to include your consumer research evidence that you've got about your product um, and also the name of the supplier of research and any accreditations that they have just to make sure that you're very clear it's a um you know a very good uh, accredited 
independent testing house um, so they can look at that data and they, they know that it should be reliable. Um, undesirable effects as well. So obviously that can come out of your safety data, but that is also recorded for our consumer research data. So while the participants um, have real-time reporting for their online questionnaire, we also have online uh, real-time reporting for our undesirable effects as well. Um, so this generally won't be a serious undesirable effects. I haven't in the whole time I've been at Aid and Global Research experienced a serious undesirable effect. I'm not sure if we ever have, um, because generally things have been safety tested at this point. So you know you're quite safe here. But it does record things like, you know, people say they got a slight itching or a slight burning, slight redness to the skin, it made them break out. It's all really important undesirable effects um, that you need to know. So again, if you find that um, even a small percentage, like 5% of 100 people are saying they got a breakout, if you think about scaling that up to your market, you might actually want to relook at your formula. Because when you think about, you know, 5% of 100 isn't huge, but 1,000, 10,000, all of those kind of units, that might be quite a large amount and you don't really necessarily want to have that effect. Or you just think about who you're marketing your product towards, because if you find that it's a certain skin type that's having that effect, um, you can kind of look at, look at changing that. Um, but it's also really important for your responsible person. I'll just skip onto the next <laughs> slide here. It's really important for your responsible person um, to be aware of that undesirable event reporting because they'll have real time access to it as well. So if they need to look into that further, they can do that without delay. Um, it's all compliant with the Cosmetic Vigilance Act, so it's all been um, built in terms of complying with that. Um, so, sorry, this slide is all about ACE and Global Research Standards. So, as mentioned, this is what consumer research is, but this is our standards that we're very proud of um, to be able to be an accredited independent testing house. So, I've talked about the responsible person, um, undesirable reporting, and Cosmetic Vigilance Act. Uh, we also have product liability insurance, and it's really important that any testing house you use does um, because it it protects you against anything that could go wrong in the study, whether it's your fault or it's our fault, which I have to say we've never ever had a case against us in product liability, but it's there to protect us. So for example, if we had something like the, the wrong usage directions and that meant someone had a serious undesirable event, it means that not only us, um, but also you are covered because that could be even mistake, doesn't matter. The wrong use directions have gone out there and we need to make sure we're covered against it. Um, you also need to let your product liability insurance provider know that you're conducting consumer research for that reason and that we've got product liability insurance. It just covers everyone and makes everyone feel very, very safe. Um, we have an ISO 27001, which means we're compliant with the GDPR Act, um, the GDPR regulations. Um, so again, this really, yeah, you have to be to be an EU provider and we are based in the UK. Um, but it's really important to think about globally as well. It really means that we've got the best kind of um, systems in place to protect our participants and their data, but also to protect you and your data as well. Um, it makes sure, you know, any kind of information about your product, you know, it's protected by our data protection officer um, who is constantly on training and doing exams for data protection. Um, so always up to date on everything to do with GDPR. Um, and, and get it, including that audit for the ISO 27001. Uh, we also have an ISO 9001, which is all to do with um, quality assurance. And again, just, just letting you know that our procedures are always reviewed and audited as well. Uh, and we're also a partner to the Market Research Society, who I touched on earlier about questionnaire design. Um, they have their own code of conduct to do about doing basically conducting correct research and ethical research. And to be a partner, you have to be reviewed and made sure that you're following that code of conduct. Um, further advice for consumer studies. Um, so I would say a panel size starting at around 100 responses. This really depends on the claims you're making and the product you're making the claims about. It can really change. Um, so always seek advice on that one. But generally 100 responses, if you're looking at one product and sort of um, kind of a different efficacy claims tends to be sufficient. Um, but again, if you're looking at things like different curl types, hair types, skin types, you may be looking at increasing that substantially. We've talked about product liability insurance. I touched on safety testing, um, but all, really important to note that all products that are go through consumer testing have to be safety tested first. I always say to the point where they could be released on the market. Um, so whatever safety testing, again, it can be different for different types of products and different types of skin types. But every kind of safety testing that you would need in place to ensure that it's safe for your consumer to use, that's what we need to make sure is safe for our participants to use.
Um, again, uh, samples need to be debranded. Um, so if we can run blind studies, which would be anything to do with claim substantiation or comparison studies, they're always blind studies. Um, so make sure that that's all been debranded. Um, your questionnaire design will always support your claims. We've talked about questionnaire design today. And again, always feel free to seek advice if you are unsure on anything um, from your research agency and hopefully from us. So just to finish off, um, before we go to the question and answer, um, question and answer time, I just wanted about some bad um, <laughs> advertising campaigns, essentially. So we looked at good practice, this is poor practice. And essentially, um, I've just put out some claims about unsubstantiated claims. Um, so um, like I, I've always mentioned this, I'm not saying that these products don't work. I'm just talking about the bad press that it provides. If you don't have your claims substantiated, um, the ASA in particular um, and the FTC, they announce all of the campaigns that have, you know, that they've had to withdraw any kind of advert that to withdraw. It's really poor um, publicity. So obviously Maybelline got um, a lawsuit against them about claiming um, in the US because they're claiming about a 10 hour stained gloss, um, 14 hour lipstick, but they were inaccurate and deceptive. Um, there was an advert for proactive, um, but actually this was to do with, um, they were basically showing the US advert, which has a different formulation to the UK um, products. So obviously the advert is going to show a different effect because it's a different formulation. So again, be really careful if you're a global company and you've got global advertising campaigns because you might find that you're actually getting in trouble for showing the wrong advert in the wrong territory. And the essay order one I wanted to bring up because this was to do with um, that they basically that their sales were blemished by false advertising revelations, and this was to do with their internal data. So in the US, um, there are some claims that you can use internal data to substantiate. Again, that is not the case worldwide. Um, so if you're looking at global advertising, while you may be able to use internal data to substantiate claims in certain territories, you are not allowed to in other territories. So I'd always recommend getting external data for your claims. Um, but particularly in this case, um, they found that the staff had actually manipulated the data, um, which obviously you're not going to get if you use external um, companies because there's no bias towards your company, whereas your staff will have a bias there. Um, so again, I just wanted to bring that up because it just shows how, you know, how damaging it can be on a brand um, if you've got anything. And it, again, it, it cannot be that they're trying to be deceptive or trying to mislead. It's just you're not aware of the advertising regulations. Um, so it can really cause some issues. So I'm going to open up to a question and answer now. Thank you for your patience. I've got some questions that have come in. So I'd really like to um, answer these now. Um, so the first one is what is the difference between direct and implied claims? Um, so but direct claims are literally to do with um, it's, it's basically, you know, directly. So you're saying, you know, this product makes your skin look younger. Implied claims tends to talk about um, things like, so if your product is a shampoo, the implied claims is that it cleans the hair. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we talk about when we talk about implied claims. It's really, it's quite broad. Um, so direct is always like, you know, this product exactly does this. And the implied claims could be, oh, it's a, if your product's called a moisturizer, the implied claim is that it moisturizes the skin. Um, so you need to make sure you have that substantiated as well. Like I said, you can't kind of call your product a moisturizer if you've got no evidence to say that it moisturizes the skin. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about direct and implied claims. I hope that kind of clears that up. <laughs> Uh, so the next question, um, do some countries require higher numbers of respondents to substantiate a claim over other countries? Um, a good question, and no, unfortunately not. There is no regulation. Um, this is what is the most first frustrating things for us and for our clients as well. There's no regulation about the number of respondents you need for each claim. And again, each claim and each product is really, really different. Um, however, it is up to, you know, it's, 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 it's up to the SRO to say whether they think your data is substantial or not so where there may not be um you know where there may not be a kind of um clear regulation if you only had 30 participants the sro could turn around and say that's not enough um that's not enough data there so i always say just be really really confident in your body of evidence to make sure um that, that, that you're really really confident if it did come under scrutiny that you've got enough data there um what that means is can be different i that's why i tend to say 100 responses because that makes me feel really confident generally um that it would withstand any scrutiny from sros um but yeah it's a real range between product and claim as well and there is an irregulation for different countries so sorry there'll be much more help on that one 
Um, oh, it's lost my mouse a minute there again. Um, so when you are trialing SPF products, would you trial them as an SPF cream or say a day cream um, slash moisturizer? Sorry, I keep losing my mouse there. Um, so SPF products, I always say there's an SPF in it. It's really important to note. Um, the main reason for this is because you need to, you know, you're, you're sa the safety of the consumers as well. So if people are used to using a daily cream that has an, um, an SPF in it, they need to know that. We've had it before where people haven't had an, we haven't had SPF in the moisturizer and participants have asked, you know, has this got an SPF in it? Um, so we, we've, you know, we've had to say, no, it doesn't. So they need to be able to make an informed decision about whether they can join the study based on the ingredients that are, that are in it. So we need to have an SPF. It's really important to note, um, I can't remember the exact ISO is called, but there is a certain ISO that you need for SPF products. And we are, um, they, they have to be attested in regulation with that ISO for us to be able to test them as well. Um, but yeah, it's really important. Again, it's um, even though it's, it's kind of in the view of consumer research rather in the view of advertising, it's still the same informed decision making we have to allow our participants. They have to know enough detail about the product without giving away what the ability of the product is um, and kind of the effects that they should, they, we're desiring um, for them to be able to join the study. I hope that makes sense. Um, so would an ingredient claim fall under an implied claim, claim e.g. contains aloe vera or contains moisturising aloe vera? Um, so yeah, I guess that would kind of be an implied claim. It's kind of a bit of a both one. <laughs> it's direct and it's implied because, you, you know, it's a direct claim saying this product contains this, this ingredient which has this effect. But it's also implied that because the product contains that ingredient, that it is going to have that effect. Again, and I can't stress this enough, um, you always need to get the final product tested. I've had so many clients that kind of say, well, we've already got the evidence from the ingredients to say it can do this effect, but there's nothing to say that when it's actually in the final product, the consumers are going to be able to perceive the effect from the raw data you have. Um, so because it's just based on that ingredient itself. Um, there can also be certain ingredients that are going to negate each other that might, you know, kind of um, sort of weaken that effect of the product. So always get the final product tested um, and then you can really confidently say that it has the ingredient in it and that it has these effects. Plus you can say more about your product as well because if you're testing the final product, you're not relying just on that product claim. You're also relying, um, you're, you're also able to get some extra data from doing some consumer research. Um, oh, I think that was just a typo on the last one. Um, oh, someone said they have shared the presentation, uh, missed the presentation, sorry. That's no problem at all. Um, I'm going to be emailing the recording straight after the event. Um, so yeah, not a worry there. Um, someone would also like to know more about dermatology dermatology claims like dermatologically tested and hypoallergenic um, so those are to do with safety testing so if you get a um, gosh I can't remember what it stands for um, HI PRT test and that a patch test basically any kind of safety testing you have about your product so like I said all of our products have to be safety tested before we can release them to our consumers and um, that does also cover your hypoallergenic hypoallergenic and dermatologically tested claims so any product that has been um, safety tested on the on the skin make sure you ask your safety testing provider um, that they are able to say those make make sure they follow the procedures so you can say those claims as well but yes you can make those claims about your product um, as long as it has had the correct safety testing put in place um, have we got any more questions at all before i move on i'll just leave that open for a minute Um, as mentioned, please feel free to email me any questions. If you've got any that come up after the event, um, that's not a problem. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll close that for now and just finish off the presentation. But uh, I will email the link to the recording directly from my personal email address. Um, so you can have a look at that um, and reply to me with any questions that you may have that are further. So just to finish off, um, I just want to point your direction in the SCS, the Society of Cosmetic Chemists. Oh, scientists, sorry. Um, so they've got some upcoming training and events. 
their training that they have is the distance learning course, um, which is a recognized course in the essentials of cosmetic science. I said this at the end of every presentation, it is a perfect time to be looking at doing a course like this. If you've been interested in it in the past, maybe put it off, um, but you've got a bit of free time because you're working from home or you're not able to do anything socially that you used to, and you'd like to increase your education a little bit, um, really, really good course to look into in for cosmetic science there. Um, so they've got a website that you can have a look at cosmeticlearning.com um, and you have a look at that course there. There's also going to be the IFSCC Congress, which is going to be in London in September 2022. Um, so hopefully this will all be passed by then and we can all go and uh, network at the Congress event um, so that we can register your interest there um, at the website now. Uh, so thank you very much for listening today. Um, I really hope that's been useful and that I've managed to answer your questions. Um, again, I know it's been a lot of information. Um, like I said, it's quite a large subject to kind of put into a sort of an hour webinar. Um, but yeah, yeah, I hope that you found it really useful. If there's anything more specific that you need some help on, um, please let me know. Um, and um, you can reply to my email. Um, thank you very much. And yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>